Back when I was in college, there was a kind of an up-and-coming televangelist who was on uh, late night local TV, and he was, he was a great source of entertainment. Um, one particular time, he was having his version of a telethon, and uh, a call came in, and someone pledged that, uh, um, I, th I think it was going to be like $5,000, and, and this man was just exuberant with joy. And so the next time, there he is, he's on television, and he doesn't look very happy. And one of the first things that he does after the introductory music to his t television show is he reaches into his suit pocket and he pulls out several thousand dollars of Monopoly money. And he said, he said, whoever called in to pledge all of this money and sent in the Monopoly money, and here's where he went straight in for the camera. And he looked at the television audience and he said, God gonna get you, sucker. <laughs> and it was very entertaining and gave us an occasion to be religiously condescending and contemptuous, which is one of the sweetest and most contagious sins that there is. And it also gave us a reason to dismiss the subject that the man had been talking about. He had been talking about God's judgment. And isn't that a subject that we might like an excuse to dismiss? After all, God's judgment is often associated with people like, like this gentleman. People who play on our guilt and our fears and our vulnerabilities. And, and doesn't such teaching usually reveal a rather old-fashioned, a rather Old Testament notion of God? We believe in a God of love, and, and judgment just has trouble fitting into that picture. But I want to invite you to do something with me this morning. Would you join me, and let's let down our defenses just a bit and hear something from Jesus on the subject of God's judgment. Jesus in Luke chapter 13 provides some clarity to a conversation that is going on in the Bible and that is going on in the biblical interpretation of his day and of our day. In this section of Luke's gospel, Jesus is speaking about God's judgment and the need for repentance in light of God's judgment. Jesus is teaching and someone in the crowd waves the hand while Jesus is teaching on repentance and judgment and says, hey, Jesus, have you heard about the Galileans? They were at the temple. They were in the midst of making their sacrifice. And Pilate sent soldiers, and whoosh, the blood of these Galileans mingled with the blood of their sacrifice. And what do you think of that? Jesus. Whoever told him this story was making a connection, a theological connection between Pilate's killing of these Galileans and God's judgment on them. The thinking was clearly these folks were bad because this happened. And Jesus responds, do you think? that because these Galileans suffered in this way, 
they were worse sinners than all other Galileans. No, I tell you, no. Now, the idea that tragedy and suffering can be traced back to someone's sin or, or to some sin in their family or tribe, and, and that therefore they are experiencing the just judgment of God, has some space devoted to it in the Bible itself. And here, Jesus weighs into the conversation and says that you cannot always trace a line from someone's suffering to their sin and to God's judgment of their sin. In fact, I think that Jesus is teaching it's a waste of time. Now, why am I spending time on this? I, I say all of this to make a point. I think it's a very important point. Just because we have a theological idea. Just because we have some verses to back up that idea doesn't mean that we have arrived at the truth of the matter. Let's just get real practical. Let's say that if you believe that you can look at the suffering of New Orleans after Katrina, Let's say if you can look at the suffering of the Missouri and the Mississippi River Valleys today. Let's say if you can look at the country of Mozambique this last week. Let's say if you are a person who can look at the suffering in Christ Church, New Zealand, or if you can look at the mass incarceration and death of black folk and say, well, there you go, it's sad, but they must have deserved it. Jesus is saying, if you have such an opinion, if we have such an opinion, we are all leaves and no fruit. And if you can say the opposite, well, look at me. I'm healthy. I'm relatively wealthy, I'm smart and educated, I've got several correct opinions, I must be living right and blessed. Jesus is saying to us, if we think that way, I'm sorry, but you're all leaves and you're no fruit. Now, part two of this story. Jesus responds to the issue, Galileans, suffering, sin, judgment. He says he can't draw the straight line. It's a waste of time. Don't do it. And even if you can quote Scripture, doesn't mean that you've got the fruit of the kingdom of God in your life. He then goes to the story, the parable of the fig tree. And he says there's this guy. He's got the big vineyard. He's got the fig tree. Apparently, it takes two years for a fig to show fruit once it's even mature. And the guy keeps going back to the fig tree looking for some fruit under the leaves. Can't find any. So the guy goes to the gardener and says, let's just cut this thing down. It's taking up space. We'll plant another one. And I, Jesus is so sly when he tells stories. Folks have just come to the conclusion, oh, that's God. God is the guy who owns the vineyard who wants to cut the tree down because it's not bearing fruit. And then Jesus slips in another character, the gardener. And Jesus says, and a gardener, and a gardener said, no, let's not cut it down. Let me dig down to the root. Let me fertilize it and let's wait. I, I believe I can get some fruit out of this barren fig tree. And then Jesus smiles and looks into the eyes of everyone and they, aha! So that is what God the judge is like. 
God is the kind of judge who's not cutting down trees willy-nilly. God is the kind of judge who is the joyful gardener who says, I can get some life out of that barren tree. I, I just need some time to dig down into the roots and to give it some nourishment. This tree doesn't need to be cut down. This tree needs to be fed. And I'm the one to feed it. We might want to avoid the subject of the judgment of God. But, but, if we can realize that God judges us like a gardener, judges a tree that needs nourishment, I think we can see that God's judgment is a gift that can lead to deep and to abundant life, fructiferous life, fruitful life.